Thanks. Yes, we are recording. Um, thanks very much for coming. Thank you for your time. Um, as Lorna said, my name is Kane Murdoch. I am from Macquarie Uni in Sydney, and that doesn't seem to want to work at all. Um, I'm the head of complaints, appeals and misconduct for the university. And as you imagine, that's a fairly big and broad job. Um, my background, just in 30 seconds, I've spent about seven years um, investigating various forms of cheating and student you know, malfeasance. Um, and when you start really digging in, into it as your day job, you tend to kind of work out more where the edges are rather than just seeing what you see in coming in front of you. So a teaching academic might see plagiarism, they might see an instance of contract cheating. And I've started to kind of scope out where the, the true limits of the business are in our universities. And let me tell you, um, what I've seen absolutely supports the research, which says the best available research says about 10% of students are contract cheating, for example. And so it tells us that more students cheat at a more at a broader scope than we generally think. And as soon as we saw ChatGPT come along, most people immediately saw the implications for a lot of different types of assessment. And with the advent of GPT-4, it's even better. It can it doesn't make a lot of the errors that GPT-3 and 3.5 make. And I wanted to be able to talk through the implications of that because we tend to think of it as like a teacher's problem. You know, how do you protect your unit? How do how are you going to redesign your assessments? And I think that's a really poor starting point, generally speaking. So in my view, like people want to think about how do we how do we detect them? How do we find these cheats? And I don't think it's a very helpful framing for this because fundamentally what GPT and contract cheating before it has shown is that we have an assessment validity problem. And we think about validity as in, is an assessment testing what we think it's supposed to test? And But the real problem, or at least a subsidiary problem, is that who are we testing? And that's the fundamental question that I ask. Who exactly are we testing when we assess? And so we have this problem. To me, this is the problem, and it's a much bigger problem than any given lecturer can possibly even hope to solve. It's going to take some higher level thinking at a higher level in all of our institutions. And people also have this idea, people have said to me that, oh, contract cheating has ended, hasn't it? No, no, it hasn't. The five death threats that I've had this year tend to su suggest that it is a very active and ongoing market that doesn't want to give up its kind of dirty lucre for one of a better phrase and so it's a compounded problem now students have more availability rather than a different availability of you know access to avoid being assessed and just to give you a picture of what cheating can look like this is a network diagram each of the blue dots is a student all of the lines are shared IP addresses between those students, and this is all in one subject. So mass commercialized contract cheating is ongoing, and it is not a problem that has gone away. It was a problem that will evolve and adapt, basically in order to harvest money out of students' pockets, and will have an incredibly damaging effect on our institutions. So when I think about AI, I don't think about a pedagogical problem, even though it is. I think about institutional risk and the risks that we are running unknown, like GPT kind of made those risks slightly more obvious, brought it above ground and we lost plausible deniability. We can't, we can't deny any longer that we have a very serious problem. But I don't think there's any real sense of what those risks are and how we are actually going to be able to address them. So let me talk about those risks. To my mind, the risk that the public loses faith that we can assure them that the students we put out the gates at the end of their degrees are who they say they are and know what, they, what we say they know and have the skills that we say they have. That is a very serious risk. Accrediting bodies, government, 
the media is often seen as a risk, but a media is just a window into broadcasting those risks more broadly. And so we need to be thinking about this as a risk problem for every institution. And it, to my mind, handing this level of risk to any given academic and saying in your own little silo, fix the problem is not an effective way to manage that risk. So when we turn to the kind of back to the problem, we no longer have reliable assessment in many, many ways that we've relied upon. Online quizzes, they're cheap, they're scalable. Essays, they're cheap, they're scalable. Exams, to a different extent, they're more costly. And so the age of cheap assessment I think is a major implication of ChatGPT. The age of cheap assessment is dead. <coughs> Apologies, I've brought a cold with me from Ireland, getting over it. Um, so we need to be able to think about how do we go about managing the resources that we have, because we're not going to get new ones. Observing your government currently, they're not handing any more money to education. So we need to be thinking about how do we make better use of what we have now and while boosting the security of our assessments. <coughs> so obviously the you know, typical answer is throw everyone back into an exam hall and line them up, sit them down, have retirees walk up and down these, these corridors here. I understand it's sometimes a bit different here, like an academic will have to turn up an eyeball, but then again, when I receive an email, which I have from our federal police with a 12 pictures of student cards, all with the same man's face on it, different students. And also from my experience that five years ago, the most common form of misconduct was in exams. Students are bringing phones into exams. They write on the back of water bottle labels. They write in tiny, tiny writing in dictionaries. Students have been cheating exams for millennia. And moreover, even when it was punishable by death in the Chinese civil service, people still cheated. So I'm not entirely convinced that this is the answer. I think it's a simple answer, but it flies in the face of everything we've tried to kind of work, work in the opposite direction for, for about 20 odd years. And it, this also implies that if you can't secure the rest of your assessment, this has to be a very, very high stakes assessment in every single module, every su subject, there's different terminologies. Um, and it also begs the question, what are we testing then? Because if it's not open book, we're effectively testing recall to an extent. And so, you know, we're kind of wallowing in the bottom of blooms there really, aren't we? And so I'll kind of ask the question again, who actually are we assessing in the age of massified education? Who knows all their students? Some of you might be lucky. You might have only like 30 students in your unit. Hands up if you've got more than 100. Plenty of hands, more than 300. Hand here, there's subjects of up to 2000 students in universities that I've worked at, I'm sure it wouldn't be that unusual. We maybe have less universities per head than the UK, but still, if you have 300 students, you certainly do not know all of them. You wouldn't even be able to recognize all of them, let alone have a deep and familiar view of their work, especially across a program. So you're getting a snapshot of them at a particular point in time. You didn't see them before, you didn't see them after. And so you don't really know them at all. And so who are we assessing? Are we assessing chat GPT? Hands up if you think you've read an essay that was generated out of chat GPT. Third of the room. So I also start to think about, you know, the kind of, we, we must trust our students as an answer. And I'm very, very pro student despite what I do. Um, but also students have students are varied and complex and they have lots of different motivations. And sometimes those motivations get the best of them when it comes to making bad decisions. Sometimes they 
feel compelled to cheat. I'm sure they can rationalise it in a hundred different ways, but it doesn't change the fact that they didn't do the assessment. So in other words, when they get through un unnoticed, we have a problem and then it encourages them next time because once you don't get picked up the first time, it really says to them, keep going because they assessed the risk at that point in the first time. And so the risk probably got lower because they've convinced themselves that it's, they're not gonna get caught. So we really need to be thinking about short-term and long-term plans. Like what do we do tomorrow versus what can we do next year? Um, and I think this comes, when I think about all these things, they come down to an economic problem. We have got, or at least the problems the solutions can be economic as well. We in universities spend vast resources for arbitrary reasons. Hands up if any of the teachers in the room have ever kind of seen a special consideration, a mit cert, I think it's called here. Yep, most. So we ask students to provide these certificates. They go into the doctor and cough and tell them they've felt terrible. They pay 30 quid and they produce a certificate. Sometimes those get faked. We get a fair chunk of that, you know, changing the dates to suit their assessment or reusing a medical certificate. And we do this under the guise of fairness. It wouldn't be fair to all the other students if that student got an extra day to complete their assessment. Now we don't police a fairness in a multitude of ways. So the wealthy student from a wealthy background who doesn't have to work has a very significant advantage over the student who has to work 50 hours a week on top of uni. We don't, we don't care about that unfairness, but we apply these arbitrary unfairnesses to things like that. And it costs us money. So it needs people to stamp it, you know, digitally or no. It takes people like me to investigate it when it goes wrong. It takes you time to kind of process this thing and whatever processes you have for handling them. And there are lots of different things like this. The other thing I'd note is that things like, um, what are they called, adjustments for say disabilities and things like this. All those things are kind of arbitrary. There's research published recently that looks at is basically uh, disability adjustments, they're treated as an attempt to cheat. And we universities look at them as if students are trying to get one over them. Now, I don't subscribe to that at all, but we could start thinking about that and start to think about universal de design for learning. But you can't do it at a single modular level. You know, what you do might be slightly different to what they do, and you would have to go and speak to the disability people and work that all the way through. So we need to start raising up the level of assessment to more of a program level. You each, have, I'm sure, have your kind of individual su subject unit learning outcomes, and it's often debatable how well those feed into a program level outcome. And at the moment, we cannot assure the public, the government, taxpayers, accrediting bodies that those program level learning outcomes are met. So in my space, I don't want to go too far abroad, but you know, the current kind of challenges, as I said, like these things are stacking up. You're still, I'm sure, seeing plagiarism matters come across your desks. They haven't evaporated overnight because of ChatGPT. They're still happening because students make mistakes. You know, students don't always understand how to paraphrase very well. Sometimes they just run out of time and stick in a bunch of crap references in the hope that you don't check them. And that's surprisingly often the case. So, you know, we have a broad assessment problem and we have a bunch of weaknesses in our assessment. And those weaknesses are getting more and more plain for those who care to look. Now, when we keep looking at a single modular level and putting it on one person, it relies on their skill set, relies on their time. You know, if they are research intensive versus teaching intensive, if they have 300 students versus 30, all of those things impact your ability to effectively redesign your subject, even if you are capable of doing so in light of ChatGPT. So, as I said, we still have the plagiarism problem, but it's a problem relatively, you know, handled, like turn it in for all its fail 
failures and critics. It kind of does what it says on the tin, which is not catch plagiarism. It's to identify similarity. And you can look at that as an academic and I can look at that in my professional space and I can go, yeah, it probably was or it, or it wasn't. And you can reach a reasonably sound finding on that, you know, on balance of probabilities, as they say. Did the student mean to do this? Did they not? Is it a small piece? Is it a large piece? You can get a pretty good picture. File sharing, we haven't really gotten on top of that because you can throw endless energies into chasing these things down. The amount of requests I've had to sue Course Hero to get a link taken down is great. Very, very many requests, very low value, very high time in t time spent doing it. And effectively, I refu refuse to do it. In my view, these questions, if you've asked them once, it's done. You have to write it again. So assessment becomes all the more time consuming in light of that, because you just can't keep asking the same exam questions, the same quiz questions. You have to repeat them never. You have to rewrite them every single time. And that's the problem that file sharing creates. Contract cheating, that's my particular love. I've been looking at that for about seven years. And that, while they may have taken a bit of a hit, contract cheating is much more broad than people generally understand. I'll talk about this more in depth later on this afternoon, the second talk, but it's not just SA Mills. It's not just CHEG. It's not just a transactional thing. Students get entire subjects done for them and they can get many subjects done for them across a program if there's insufficient um, optics on this at an institutional level. It's not something that an academic can successfully do because you have limited access to data, you have a limited skill set, limited time, and you've got other priorities, and I, I get that. That's why really it's very important that universities actually stop relying on academics to fix these problems. Because in my view, academics have failed, and that's not like a personal critique, it's just an objective fact. Academics have not successfully got anywhere near the 10% of students who contract cheat. So you'd be lucky if you get 0 0.001, and they're rare. Um, briefly, in order to address some of these things, we use a data-driven approach to detecting contract cheating, which makes it scalable, which makes it efficient, and also makes it fair because we're actually bringing out objective facts rather than a kind of subjective, this student couldn't have written this piece of work take. And so when you can start reducing the amount you spend for a bigger impact, that's generally the way to go, as long as that remains fair. So we use Wiru to examine LMS data or VLE, depending on the terminology, and we bring in Turnitin metadata. And so you can look at this, we produce a variety of different evidence. So we can use something in deep analysis, but we can also use this to show our registrar, for example, that this unit isn't a problem. So what you see here again, the dots are students, the lines are shared IP addresses. This is like a bunch of students sharing flats. This is perfectly normal. But when you look at that, that gives you a very different picture of what's happening. So that's a, probably 80 students in a subject, all sharing a very, very large number of IP addresses. So in effect, randomly sharing these IP addresses to randomly complete all their assessments just in this subject. And so you can give you a much deeper insight, both at a institutional risk level, so we can systematically go through all our subjects and get a very quick view about whether we think we have a problem. And so we come to AI. Now, there's been a lot of discussion of the detectors. I'm not sure what Leeds' take on this is. We turned ours off. Quite simply, there's, there's really two reasons. For my mind, for some reason, PowerPoint moves my text boxes. Um, like as an investigator, I can receive a piece of evidence and I want somewhere else to go. I want some way to corroborate that evidence. Now with the detector, you have one black box interrogating another black box and it spits out a number and you either take the number as gospel or you don't. 
there is nowhere else for an investigator to go except an academic holding what amounts to a viva, an oral exam with a student every single time that you get a number that you think is concerning. Now, when you do the maths on that, that becomes problematic and I'll show you what that means in a sec. But without the ability to follow the trail, you're at a dead end. You've got nowhere to go as an investigator. And so I think that raises very real questions of fairness about whether it could possibly be fair just to take the number because we've got no idea what's in those black boxes in truth. And so, in other words, students have no way to defend themselves against a claim that they use ChatGPT or some other AI tool. So, in other words, the investigation ends and you either make what I, what I believe is an unfair decision or you dismiss it. There's not many other avenues to go down. And so you're stuck. You still have the same problem. You don't know who wrote the essay or did the quiz. You can't be sure that your student has been accurately assessed. You can't even be sure that it is your student. And or you, you just obey the number. Now, maybe I'm just contrary, but personally, I don't really believe in doing that. I don't think it's fair in the same way that I never thought it was fair that people put arbitrary numbers and said anything above 30 percent and turn it in is plagiarism because that's very assessment and discipline specific. If you have a scientific report, have a, might have a lot of common language in a history essay, it might be much more different. And so there are different expectations. So don't obey simple numbers. But to do the maths on this, so in Australia, there is approximately a million students. And Turnitin's own numbers, they say they have 0.7% false positives. Now, if we assume four assessments per student per subject, and you go down the road of actually orally examining them, that means that the academics in Australia will have to run 125,000 unscheduled oral exams every semester, oh, sorry, every year. So 60,000 a semester. Now, um, I'm not an academic, but I'm fairly sure your workload models don't account for that. And so that leaves you at a bit of a crisis. You either choose to pour your own personal time into this problem or you close your eyes and the risk rises. So what I'm arguing here is that while we should trust students, we can't have a kind of close your eyes trust of students because, as I said, students are complex. Some will choose to you know, break your institutional rules because it's in their interests. Some will not, some will never. It should have been perfectly obvious that students aren't all the same. Students aren't all academic integrity champions. They're not all no good nicks either. We have this idea that everyone needs to be surveilled all the time in a really quite intrusive way. Like for example, Proctorio and online invigilation during COVID, everyone needed to be invigilated all the time. And personally, I think that's highly damaging to their ability to perform and demonstrate their learning. And so I think that has other drawbacks as well. But your ability to verify at a module level is highly restricted. You can't do it fundamentally. As, a, as an entire group, collectively, you can't do it as an individual. Because as I said, time, skill, interest, you know, what your pre-existing beliefs, if you don't think contract cheating is a big problem, you won't go looking for it. And so, and you don't have the tools in order to do that. So how do you go about verifying? I'm suggesting that we should be looking at institutional level program learning outcomes and institutional assessments. So it can't all be on your head. And that obviously has workload implications. And that's where I come back to the point. We need to think about very, very carefully every single arbitrary thing we do that costs us money and costs us time because that's where we're going to be able to make these things work. Every single paper you have to process, that's time that you can't afford and the institution can't afford. I'll highlight again here that 
I hate the word stakeholders, but how long do we think people can call universities sausage factories and we can kind of quietly admit it to ourselves that there is a certain kind of factory-like motion to the whole thing? How long do we think in the age of chat GPT and contract cheating where an assessment is not valid, that they will not notice and they will keep funding us? As I said, it seems to me from your news that you already have pretty severe challenges with this government. And I think it would only get worse if the things we can say internally went out the gates. Stupid PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> and so reputation to me is like the first thing that chips it's the first thing that will shatter. It won't be the thing, a kind of catastrophic collapse across the board. And then we get a bad reputation. It'll happen the other way around. People will hold universities in contempt because we refuse to acknowledge what's clearly happening. And like that often happens via the media. And I'm sure your, your university is no different from mine. And, and they're paranoid about bad news. I tend to think when a uni actually takes really solid steps forward and owns the message it drags other unis forward with them they don't want to outcompete themselves they all kind of go i don't want to stick my head above the parapet and be the brave one because it'll cost me money or it'll cost me students if we do this students will think they're going to get caught and they'll go over there or i think if we can all kind of act as more a collective we can actually rebuild our reputation because i think the public you know doesn't hold us in high esteem to our great disappointment. As I said, long-term and short-term thinking. So long-term, we need to be thinking about how we assess program level learning outcomes. And those need to be in a secure environment. So I tend to think we need to split. At the moment, we have you know, assessment for learning, but really students are only interested in the marks. Have a look at the research on feedback, and they don't read it. So you pour your time into providing high quality feedback and they don't read it because the only feedback they wanted was the mark. And so we think about those things and we think about learning and getting feedback and having repeatable learning activities, let's say. Let's say your online quiz that you put a hell of a lot of effort into, into creating a lot of randomized questions, for example. And then if you have to burn all the questions every single time, you just go, why the hell did I bother? where if it's actually for learning and not marks, you don't have the same problem. And students can choose to learn or not. But when it comes to a program level secure set of assessments, they will either have to demonstrate learning or they will fail. So it's kind of choose your own door type of thing. You know, I think in the, what, nearly year, it's like 11 months since ChatGPT came out. I haven't seen any uni truly looking at the problem as I see it. And now maybe I'm a weirdo. That's that's distinctly possible. But if it's still like just hand down this kind of bucket of extrament down to academics and go, good luck with that. Good luck cleaning it up. And I don't think that's still there. Sorry, Mike fell off. Um, I don't think that's a long term solution to anything much. I think we're putting ourselves in great danger, actually as institutions, you know, the church was once powerful in Ireland and it's not nearly as powerful anymore. There's lots of institutions that have come and gone over the years and research won't save us. We think of research as this mighty engine. I personally, I, I'm, I'm not sure I believe it. I think it's a citation factory and a prestige factory. And we're not really thinking about, and that conference last week in Galway, we saw plenty of evidence of widespread research misconduct. And so people who might have got away with something once feel more compelled to do it again because it suited their interests. So we have to start thinking about how we start preventing those things happening without being hugely punitive, because that is another way we just burn resources spending tons of time handling plagiarism matters and not getting anywhere much. Does it matter whether a student screwed up APA 7 reference? No, not really. It doesn't. 
So we have to start thinking about funding, have to start thinking about where we actually, we don't have to cut. Like the people in accessibility, they're absolutely important. Like the views that I have on what is a secure assessment are reasonably important at an institutional level. But is my time best spent talking to one student over, you know, because they punched someone in the head or because they you know, falsified a medical certificate? Probably not. So we have to start thinking about how we better deploy the resources we have. And as I said, when we're making a lot of arbitrary and historical processes, we need to challenge those processes because they're burning resources we don't have. So we need to think critically about these things. You know, what are those actions? What are those processes? How, hands up if you've sat on a decision-making committee in this room. A few, four, five, six. I calculated how much one meeting of our university's misconduct panel costs. It costs 7,000 Australian dollars. And they were deciding things like whether a student falsified a medical certificate, which the doctor had already told us they did. And so we have to start thinking about that. Appropriate levels of decision making is different. If a decision about plagiarism can be made by an academic in their subject and perhaps reviewed by someone else, if um, plagiarism can handle, be handled under an assessment policy rather than a misconduct policy, if you have plagiarism in your rubrics and a student's lose marks, that sends the signal as much as getting a misconduct charge does. And so we need to be thinking about these things and not just cutting wildly, but really thinking about, is this thing important? What is the best avenue that keeps it fair, effective and cheap? So I'm not sure if, I presume most people have kind of seen this analogy, the Swiss cheese model. At the moment, we kind of pretend to secure all of our assessment and we don't really secure any of it in truth. So we haven't really thought very deeply about this. By the way, there's a great book by Philip Dawson from Deakin University in Australia, and he talks about this, defending assessment in a kind of digital world. Well worth a read. So to start to think about what are your slices of cheese, even at a modular level, is it better to have four essays or two essays in an oral exam, a 15 minute oral exam, that oral exam will ensure your assessment much more than the other two essays. Students can still do them. You can still set questions for those students who wish to learn and extend themselves. But that kind of thing, a trade-off, where you're trading security for just what you've always done. <coughs> Pardon me. I would also suggest going through the university, and like this probably isn't up to all of you, but having a look at every single module and having a look at what assessments are there, which assessments are particularly prone to failure, online uninvigilated quizzes, stop doing them, they're worthless. Assign them no marks. They are absolutely worthless as assessment. You cannot possibly run them anymore and, and be serious. Think about assessment security. As I said, you can think about it, but it's much more problematic when it's you don't have a a big palette when it comes to a specific subject. At an institutional level, there's a much bigger palette. You could have exams, you could have defences, you could have one-to-one -one oral exams, you could have what amounts to, say, invigilated online exams. Students have varying experiences, they're not all, and we want to be able to create a platform for them to perform at their best rather than assuming that an exam is fair for everyone, which it clearly isn't. Some students absolutely just know how to do exams and others are terrible at them. And we're still not assessing what they can do. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm generally in favor of digital. However, digital for learning versus digital for assessment are two very different things. And we've kind of thought about them the same. We put quizzes up onto the LMS or the VLE and we assume it's all fine, which it obviously isn't. COVID was instructive there. COVID kind of ripped, ripped the blinkers off. So we need to start thinking about that and separating learning from assessment. And we've got to stop laying it on 
academics. As I said, you are many and varied. You have varied skill sets, time, interest, etc. So when someone like me can contribute, not so much to your teaching, I'm not your, you are the subject matter expert, but I'm, I have a subject matter expertise, which many of you probably don't. Accessibility people have subject matter expertise, which many of you probably don't. So when we, ed techs, ed devs, all of those types of people need to be more involved, not so much in your teaching, but certainly in the assessment. I'm sure they can help you with your teaching if it's separated from assessment, but nonetheless, it needs to be a team sport. It can't be personal fiefdoms. It's just not gonna work anymore. It's breaking down one by one, and it's all hanging on an exam somewhere. Stupid PowerPoint. Um, so like, choose your lane. You know, I can't make anyone do anything. All I can do is bring you enough evidence to try to convince you that there are better roads, because that's really what I'm talking about. I'm not saying like abandon this because this is the only choice. You've got a whole bunch of other choices, but we don't go looking for them because we're part of a factory, but the factory is kind of cracking and the machines are breaking down. Um, I'm going to pause there before I cough again, but I'm happy to take questions. Thanks very much. Anyone? Oh, doesn't like it. Or yeah, anyone online, so I think. Questions in the room. People who are online, you can put questions in the chat or you can put your hand up and we should be able to hear you in the room. Hi, uh, thank you for that. Um, I was just thinking about the concept that how society values higher education institutions and obviously that's something that's going down a road itself. And with ChatGPT, that's also making students specifically question the value of higher education if they can access resources free for themselves. Mm. But lots of the ways that we're trying to increase the value or highlight the value are through innovative teaching methods like group work or self-led tutorials. Yep. But in your method of visualizing academic integrity issues in the network analysis, yeah. they would be hidden there or they would they would cause a sort of masking problem. Because if we're asking for group work, it would be... But you can yeah. counter for that. Like, for example, like if there is supposed to be groups of eight. And so, as I said, when, when we all work as a team, I would understand that that subject, it has group work, it's going, students are gonna go <laughs> off to the light lane. Like, by the way, we discount on campus IP addresses and things like that. So these are all just out in the public sphere IP addresses. But certainly, like you'd see that, oh, this group of eight all work together. Well, yeah. You know. Yeah, but the more we're asking them to engage, and the more we're in, asking them to engage in groups, there's going to be more and more data that could mask the actual AI or academic integrity issues. Yeah. There. That's what I'm sort of saying. But the more we're asking them to engage, the more data there is, the more these things could fall through the cracks. It's just a thought. Possibly, but a lot of it's based on IP addresses as well so it's not just the fact that you are connected to those students connected in particular ways like that network is just a reason to take a deeper look we have as i said in the talk this afternoon i'll go into some more depth about that but there's no reason why we can't separate what you've asked for from something illegitimate but then again like i kind of go if teaching is separated from assessment i'm less concerned about that because I don't really care what they do there in that uninvigilated environment or that, you know, because we know that there would be assessment security at the key stage, stages. Um, oh, hang on, just let the mic come over. So this is definitely a stupid question, but could you explain as if you were speaking to a really stupid person, what um, the implications are of sharing an IP address? <laughs> okay, so, as I said, in that kind of the first image when there's like two students and they share one IP address, that's easily explicable. Like, I live with you in a flat and we have the same router, right? Oh, this thing hates me. Um, but what we see in that other is like, say me as one student, I share the same 
50 IP addresses with another 70 students. And there's more than that. So there's many, many connections. So it's not just one, it's improbable connections, if you want to th think about all of that. When you use, we use other evidence as well, such as if you're supposed to be in Leeds and you log on from Kenya into the VLE, that sends a very different signal as well. So we use, um, we kind of stack up evidence. We don't just go on one little data point. <laughs> Sorry. Highly probably. By someone who's not <coughs> in another place. Not yes, yeah. correct. So they're probably doing the whole subject <clears throat> rather than just one essay. Okay, yeah. uh, question from online um, from Graham Sander is, if students are using their own laptops, how do you obtain the data on the shared IP addresses? It's because your VLE, just like mine, like any website, <clears throat> captures that information. You have it right now. Um, what VLE do you use here? Blackboard? Blackboard is a little bit difficult, but Canvas, Moodle, Dare to Learn, they all, like any website, collects this information. So we've just effectively looked at it and said, that's a valuable source of information. So yeah, like it's part of just operating a website, which your VLE is. Uh, and another question online uh, from Sandy Dan. Um, what is your accessibility team's view of using Vivas for assessment? I think it depends on the student. And as I said, like, so having a one size fits all assessment, I don't think is ideal because it just won't fit many students. Like you've got 40,000, we've got 45,000. So there's going to be a significant number of students who find that extraordinarily difficult to perform. So we have to start thinking with the input of accessibility people. Yeah, you, know, you can't have an endlessly bespoke assessment system, but you can certainly give students some agency in the in what they do. So if they prefer that, they can go to their most preferable form of assessment. And if we're assessing less, that's where, again, it's a trade-off. So you're kind of going, we're, we're teaching the same amount, but we're assessing a lot less, we're marking a lot less. And then you can do, you can do bigger things, in my mind, better things. Questions over here? Sorry, thanks very much, Kane. It was really, um, should be called hard, hard facts with Kane or something. <laughs> <laughs> hard truth, I mean. So, uh, in terms of the Australian academic year, um, speaking of waves, the, it breaks a bit earlier than it does here because we're at the beginning-ish of the academic year. Are you getting any ideas about the impact of ChatGPT or other, so many other tools available uh, of, of generative AI at the moment from institutional assessments? Um, it's hard to get a picture for the obvious reason because people don't know, but um, anecdotally, people think it's about 25 to 30% is in some way being um, generated out of chat GPT. And, but there's also a, like effectively academics were given the choice. You can try to ban it. So you can say, no, totally unacceptable in this, in this subject, or you can kind of outline the reasonable ways in which students can do it and the unreasonable. Um, and so I think there's even that creates a lot of variability across the whole, um, across the university. But generally speaking, I think students would be foolish in some ways, like considering how much they have to work, considering how high rents are and cost of living. And, you know, they'd be foolish in some ways to not use it and then work on it afterwards because that even beats detectors. So you put in a well-created prompt, you work on it a bit, and then you work on the end product, which survives the detector, and you've just saved yourself tons of time. So I can see why they would. And if it's if it's that low, I'd you know, I'd almost be surprised. There was a question here. If you separate the assessment from the teaching, what does that do for assessment literacy and integrating that into the course, which 
is one of the things that I worry about when particularly looking at group work, how do they learn to work together and all that sort of stuff should be part of the teaching. So if you don't have the form, But that's learning literacy, not assessment literacy. <clears throat> So, in other words, if we can't understand why how they work effectively in groups, it begs the question, why are we putting them into groups? And usually it's because it's easier and cheaper. That's usually the reasons why people put group work on. Students hate it. They despise group work for the free riders. And they all either, you know, have to kind of suffer the slings and barbs of being the free rider or do more work to compensate for the free rider. But there are group assessments. So sure. I'm just saying um, currently available and uh, often these are project work where you can observe. So mm. actually not uh, so easily to cheat with a SML or something like sure. that. Sure, there's so plenty of disciplines like you know, engineering, say, for example, or yeah. medicine. There's a lot of reasons why people do things in teams. Yeah. That are like it's authentic the, in that yeah. discipline, obviously. That's what I'm, that's what I'm But about. you just want to get them to learn how to work in groups. You don't necessarily have to assess them working in groups. Um, unless that is the standard that is from the external required. I think as we need to have some serious conversations with accrediting bodies. Like they're often used as a kind of cover like accounting in Australia seems they just go, oh, no, we can't do that because of the accrediting body. And then when you talk to the accrediting body, the people from the accrediting body, they go, no, we don't insist upon that. And but, so in other words, it's used as cover for stasis. Well, they do in medicine and engineering at the mm. moment. It's actually spelled out that that is yeah. one of the things that they expect to <coughs> register somebody. Mm. So just the... Um, I just wondered if the separation is there, how do we teach people how to be assessed or because the assessment itself has got skills that they have to have. Yeah. Um, and if that is not part of the teaching, how, how do they learn about the assessment if it's not part of the teaching? You, you, you want to reduce the assessment so that taking out the formative or do you advocate the formative or did I misunderstand you? I think like we use formative assessment as a phrase, but when we attach marks to it, I think that students are most focused on the marks. Like students will cheat a 3% assessment, like a formative quiz. They'll cheat it because it suited them to do it. So when we think about formative, I go take away the incentive to do anything other than learn. Have them learning first and then assess them. And also the idea that a student comes up to speed perfectly all in, in a line in 12 weeks is kind of <clears throat> irrational, right? So students learn at different rates and some things click later for others. So I tend to think if they had time to let that gestate, let the kind of flavours develop and get tested on it later, they might have an upside. Pam. Do you think that there is a space for reading drafts as part of our way of getting over some of these problems with students? Scaffolding, well, in other well, words. Scaff yeah, I mean, it's scaffolding one of the ways that we can deal with some of this AI People stuff. People have been suggesting that as a response to cheating for years, and I've seen heaps of students who sent the initial question up, got a draft, submitted it, then sent the draft back, for rewriting like it's just as prone as everything else like you're assessing an artifact and not a process in other words we kind of think of it as a process but we're actually assessing a series of artifacts so how do we assess a process good question you're the teachers <laughs> like I, I don't have all the answers but i think i'm relatively good at identifying some of the problems and it's kind of we haven't had to think about these things very much we haven't thought that oh that is artifact based assessment regime is this and not that. And then, you know, we get a kind of technology change and go, oh dear, it is that, isn't it? Yeah, so another question from online. If we assess less, does that make those assessments that do take place more high stakes and therefore yeah. more vulnerable to attempts for cheating, to cheat? 
yes to the first, they kind of almost, you know, have to be higher stakes. I tend to think that making all, like, this isn't obviously in all cases, but I've seen up to like a dozen assessments in a subject. <coughs> and when you kind of atomize it to that extent, I think students develop a certain, this all means nothing. Where I think there should be stakes, I think it's how well we manage those stakes. Like, for example, if we had guaranteed resits for an assessment. So if you took it and you failed and you knew you had a backup resit, that's almost something that kind of takes away some of the stakes is because it's like if you're walking across the tightrope and you fall off and you plunge to your death, well, you know, you think about that a bit dip more differently than if you had a safety net. But also it's about demonstrating learning. So if a student can't demonstrate learning after that reset, whatever that looks like, go back and learn again. You know, in some financial arrangements, like I'm not sure what it is in England, in Australia, you kind of have to retake modules, for example. But over here, I'm not sure you get more funding if someone has to come back around. Is that how it works here? Okay, so at least, yeah. So in other words, so when we start to think about how well they met learning outcomes rather than just failing modules. So if you had an integrated assessment in a, for a core degree, like do I think it's hugely important whether the student took, you know, elementary Spanish? As long as they did the work, I'm not hugely bothered about integrating that into the core of their degree. Arts programs are more difficult than engineering engineering and medicine are much more um, constricted. But we have to start thinking about it a bit different because what we're doing isn't working. Uh, thank you very much for that. I think a lot of this makes us think, or should make us think more about the purpose of assessment, right? what it is we're going to assess, why and how. Yeah. And I think you know, that's probably one of the benefits of this uh, dialogue, this, this, this discourse that's happening. But I, that's a question if I feared. I know that in uh, some institutions they're looking at the use of honour codes to try and raise the ante a little bit and make people think twice about academic integrity. Have you a view on that? And have you any evidence about whether these things do actually function? I have a view that they don't work. Like, it's like, call it an honour code, whether you have a kind of honour code, so you're kind of going, oh, we expect you to, um, you know, to abide by these these grand principles, or whether you have a highly punitive kind of you know misconduct policy, they amount to the same thing. It's effectively a set of a line which you're expected to not cross, right? But students are crossing it routinely because there's no risk of not crossing it. So when we're totally incapable of you know understanding the scale of contract cheating, they just go. I didn't get caught. OK, I'll do it again. And so I, I think it's wishful thinking. It's just it's like, yeah, absolute wishful thinking to think that honour codes will work. So I've got the last question, but I realise we just about out of time. It was when you said 10 percent contract cheating. Mm. That's obviously across all subjects. So which subjects are actually higher than the 10 percent? Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that online minimally invigilated subjects are extremely prone to this, um, extremely prone. It's been my experience that business students have a higher likelihood of engaging in this. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, but as I said, we're going through a systematic process of running Wiru on every single subject we do. I've done all of the core of our law degree and they were quite low. And sometimes there can be external limits. Like for example, if you contract cheat and get caught and it makes it a lot harder to apply to become a solicitor through the legal practitioners board. And so there's some kind of external risks. And so they might kind of go, ooh, that's, that brings a, an, another element of risk and I don't wish to. But um, it's when students perceive, and students have told me this, when there's no risk and high reward, I'm probably going to do it. And then I'm going to keep doing it because I've convinced myself that it was safe. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.
Um, so for those of you who are in the room and staying for lunch, that's going to happen in here.